All right, welcome. We are working through some videos on nutrition trends and innovation practice and want to welcome all of you who are following along with the Nutrition for Food Technology course at Niagara College and welcome to our friends who are t um, potentially watching this video from culinary management or culinary skills. I know that some of the instructors have asked if they can borrow this video for uh, one of the online weeks and I absolutely love the opportunity to share knowledge across a wide variety of different forums. So welcome. We're going to talk about nutrition trends today and think about uh, the modality of where trends come from and how we as uh, food product innovators, whether you are a food service operator or a food product developer, how do you capitalize on the different trends that are out there and leverage your knowledge of nutrition as part of that? So at the end of this video, you'll be able to define the pathway of how many food trends are created. And we'll review a wide range of food trends impacting Canadian food service and food manufacturing. We'll justify the use of these trends in product design, and we'll research further information on food trends and evaluate the quality of the science behind the trend. So, how are food trends built? Well, it, uh, a lot of it comes down to what's the fashion of the day. In food service, a lot of restaurants have built out a following and people go and study those menus and they really look at some of these food industry leaders and food industry uh, communities, whether that uh, for the most part is food service that's driving that innovation. And so many of these innovators are really listening to the Zeitgeist or the, the movement of the day. So for example, right now there's so much innovation in, um, consumer packaged goods, where restaurants are looking at uh, taking many of their menu items and figuring out how they can turn them into packaged foods. And some of those uh, popular packaged foods are turning out onto the grocery stores. So what we often see from a trend perspective is we see really progressive restaurants, avant-garde restaurants that um, capitalize on that activist mindset or that um, really entrepreneurial, edgy um, ideation. Not just we're serving fish and chips and hamburgers, but we are really pushing boundaries of what is possible. And then we see those those trends transition to mainstream food service. So the larger corporate chains. So for example, sriracha. Think back a couple years ago. Sriracha was a niche ingredient that you found only in um, Asian grocery stores. And then some uh, food service providers, David Chang was a uh, big proponent of using sriracha and um, suddenly it becomes the hot food item. It transitions to mainstream food service and now you see it in um, cook service restaurants, um, fast food restaurants using it. And then it transitions to consumer packaged goods. And when I say consumer packaged goods, I mean stuff that you're buying at the grocery store. Um, that's how a lot of trends happen. and. It's, uh, it's really interesting because historically, if you go back 10, 20 years, it took several years for these trends to go from one to the next. And now that trend compression is much, much narrower. I want to say less than two years. The consumer packaged goods people know to look at the avant-garde food scene and they know to be looking really far forward because it takes oftentimes a year or two from idea to uh, uh, commercialization for a consumer packaged goods company to get that product from an idea to the grocery store shelf. And so the further ahead they can be in terms of researching and knowing where those trends are, the faster they're going to have that product to the market. In nutrition, a lot of the trends that are out there come from well-publicized books. And ironically, a lot of the trends come from celebrity endorsement. I want to be really, really honest. Nutrition is a science, but honestly, from an influencer culture perspective, most of the endorsement is coming through celebrity, word of mouth uh, health channels, the blogging community, the magazine community. Some of these trends are derived from science, and we're going to go through some of these trends in just a moment and, and talk about the science behind a lot of them. I'm a scientist and I really respect the scientific community, but at the same time, I also respect the fact that jumping on a trend 
can be a great way to make money. And I don't want to deny a food service operator or a consumer packaged goods company from making money. And so I think it's important to recognize the difference between science-driven nutrition versus trend-driven nutrition and um, accept the fact that both are important and know when you're starting to merge into, uh, I want to say a little bit of um, pseudoscience or quackery where you, you're, you're making stuff up just for the purposes of selling uh, versus using an appropriate level of science and uh, representing that well through a really strong communication strategy. So there are science-driven trends. Um, one of the biggest um, diets that are out there is, is called the DASH diet. It also is sometimes called the Mediterranean diet. And that's where you've got low sodium, low fat, low red meat, better fats, high vegetable and whole grains. Um, and this is extremely well researched and I've actually got some of these internet links embedded in here. I'm going to provide this PowerPoint to the different instructors who have asked if they can use this so that you can access these links as well. But what I'm linking out to here is I'm clicking. Um, no, I always joke when I make these videos that we're friends and I'm not going to edit out all my my glitches here, but this is the NIH, the National Institutes of Health of the United States Department of Health and Human Services. And despite all of the craziness going on in the United States, the United States is one of the top global leaders in terms of health and nutrition sciences. And when we see a national institute in a major industrial uh, industrialized country recommending a uh, diet or a nutrition plan, you know that there's a lot of research and a lot of investment that's gone in behind this. And in essence, the DASH eating plan, there's a whole lot of summary here, but eating fruits and vegetables, whole grains, fat-free and low-fat dairy products, fish, no promoting fish here, poultry, beans, nuts, and vegetable oils. And it just sounds like every food guide conversation that you've ever had. <laughs> Again, so many of these science-driven diets are they're not they're not exciting because they have been so well proven but that that's also really important to note because oh no I've lost which side I'm on <laughs> there we go I always joke we're friends so I'm not going to edit these out it takes too much time to edit um but uh we've got we've got a lot of uh really core fundamentals behind that and it's scientifically proven and again how do we know this is good quality science well we can recognize the authority that's coming behind that representation we see a well-respected scientific organization promoting this within their websites there's so much information on the internet and i have some other presentations that talk about reading science and understanding where information is coming from um, and so I highly recommend you check that out on my YouTube channel if you want to learn more. But we saw there was authority behind the representation there. Some more science-driven food trends. Oftentimes, different um, health organizations. I've got the Diabetes Association here, Heart and Stroke Foundation, Kidney Canada. They have a wide variety of different dietary recommendations that link out to um, science-driven trends. And... In many cases, these are really uh, linked to clinical disease diagnosis. The irony is that diabetes and cardiovascular disease are the, the dominant diseases, and a lot of it links back to obesity and overweight. And so if we're able to manage that through diet, then we're going to have better outcomes for these other clinical disease diagnoses. So in other cases, in the case of the kidney diet that they've got, um, you're looking at nutrient management. So individuals with kidney disease need to reduce their amount of dietary sodium. But we also know that reducing dietary sodium is beneficial in terms of cardiovascular disease and blood pressure. So um, again, we see a high level of authority because these are well-respected national organizations that have a lot of research and a lot of scientific backing from the scientific community. And so we know that the recommendations that are there are going to be approved by registered dietitians. And again, in the nutrition fields, there are a wide variety of different titles that people use to call themselves. In Canada, the only designation that is uh, recognized is the registered dietitian. And so all of these associations are going to have different 
dietitians evaluating the merits of those of those programs. Now we're going to just jump out into a few other trends that you're going to see in a lot of different products. Probiotics is one where you've got inclusion of good bacteria, fungi, um, into different food products. Yogurt, kimchi, miso, tempeh, cheeses. Uh, these are all different probiotic foods. You likely have just taken your food handler's certification and you've been told no bacteria in the food. Well, in some cases, bacteria is good and it can influence immunity, gut health, and more. And there's lots and lots of research. And again, I have a different slideshow where we talk about reading the science. Um, and we'll talk about how do we find scientific literature and how do we go about evaluating the quality of that. So I'll, I'll leave, I'll leave uh, the research papers to that uh, video. But what we find is that probiotics, when they're included in most highly processed foods, they're single organisms. Think about your baking class where you're adding Saccharomyces yeast. When you're getting most of the highly processed foods that have a probiotic label, it's just like adding that yeast. Whereas what we're seeing more and more is natural fermentation, where the organisms that are naturally occurring in those food products are allowed to grow and thrive. And instead of having just a single organism, you've got entire complex um, um, microbiomes that are occurring within that food product. I have a different uh, YouTube video where I talk about uh, food fermentations and I encourage you to check that one out as well. Um, prebiotics, this is another interesting one and I have a photo of green bananas up there because uh, green bananas are a really high dietary source of prebiotics. These, if you think about pre versus probiotics, prebiotics are the foods that are fostering the growth of those good bacteria in the gut. So we've got dietary fiber, fructooligosaccharides, inulin, resistant starch and sugar alcohols included in there. And a diet that's really, really um, uh, promoted widely on the internet and within different nutrition circles is what's called a FODMAP diet. And that's fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. And so these are different carbohydrates that when they get to your large intestine are fermented by the good bacteria that's in your gut. And as you know, when you uh, when you poop or defecate, it's a lot of that bulk is from different types of fiber that you consumed in your diet. And a lot of it's also good bacteria. And in essence, prebiotics are feeding and uh, giving, if I can use the term fertilizer, to the bacteria in your gut. Now, something that is common is either a high FODMAP diet, where you're including a lot of prebiotics to increase that uh, good fermentation in your gut, but we also see low FODMAP diets. And this is important for people who have irritable bowel syndrome, um, colitis or Crohn's disease, a wide variety of different uh, clinical outcomes um, related to gut health. People will want low FODMAP diets. And so we're looking at reducing fermentable sugars, fermentable fibers, um, soluble fiber, and um, the inclusion of sugar alcohols like erythritol or mannitol or sorbitol. So that's another one that you can go about researching, FODMAP diets. Oh, vegetarian and vegan. This one's huge right now. And vegetarian and vegan actually has really ancient roots in many global cultures, such as within certain parts of Hinduism and Jainism and Buddhism. Vegetarianism has been part of the, um, the religious tenet for thousands of years. And in other cases, it's part of... A, um, the calendar where people will become vegetarian or vegan for part of the season in Orthodox Christianity and in um, the Maronite tradition within the Middle East, being a vegetarian or a vegan for part of the calendar year is really important as part of religious practice. For other people, being a vegetarian or vegan is part of uh, animal ethics, that they don't want to cause harm to animals, and as such, they believe that um, by reducing animal animal agriculture, it's reducing that, uh, that pain to the animals. And in other cases, people are getting on vegetarian and vegan um, diets because they just happen to have very low cholesterol, very low saturated fat, and as such, the cardiovascular biomarkers in people consuming vegetarian and vegan diets tend to be very, very good. Um, 
what's what's been fascinating is that um, with the rise of plant-based diets, we're often seeing that term plant-based now being used instead of vegetarian and vegan. Um, there's more and more processed foods. And I, I pose this question, can you be a fat vegan? Because there's so many pr highly processed foods. If you think about it, potato chips are vegan. Um, Oreo cookies are actually vegan. And so it's very easy to follow a vegan diet anymore and eat extremely processed foods that um, don't actually promote health. And so it's it's tricky when, when we say that cardiovascular biomarkers can be very good in the consumers of these diets. But if you're just choosing chips and pickle or chips and pickles, <laughs> chips and Oreos and, and uh, processed plant-based uh, fake chicken nuggets and um, plant-based uh, KFC burgers all the time, your cardiovascular biomarkers may not be as great as you think they're going to be. And, and so again, vegetarian and vegan diets can be very beneficial from a nutrition perspective. So just to clarify again, vegetarian has no muscle proteins from animal sources and in general doesn't include fish or other animals. So no animals were killed in the process of of producing this product, but most vegetarian diets will say eggs and dairy are okay, whereas vegan diets will say no animal-derived foods at all. So no eggs, no dairy, no fish, no squids or mollusks, and in many cases vegans will even say no bees because the bees are animals too and have feelings. So that's a huge, huge trend right now, and there is a lot of good science saying that it can be beneficial, but it has to be done very carefully because these diets can be limiting in trace minerals such as iron, zinc, and copper. And um, vitamin B12 in particular and vitamin D, which are dominant in plant er, in animal-based foods, are much more limiting in terms of their availability in plant-based foods. And in general, they're coming from fortification, the intentional addition of these vitamins to processed foods. Oh, this is a good one, glycemic index. And this is this is a diet that was actually developed by uh, Dr. David Jenkins at the University of Toronto in 1980. And what he was looking at was when you eat a food, what happens to your blood sugar over time? And if you're to just eat a big, as they say, a bolus of sugar, a big blob of sugar, they, they usually do the testing on people by feeding them 50 grams of sugar. Mm. What they do is then they track your blood sugar over time to see that spike. And what he, what, da what David Jenkins did was he then built out this index saying, well, what happens if we were to put an equivalent 50 grams of carbohydrate in the food and see what happens to people's blood sugar over time from the consumption of those food products? So again, a very science-driven uh, food strategy. And I've got a second table here. So different foods... Um, if we see a, a glycemic index score of 100, in essence, it says it's the same blood sugar spike as you would see in sugar. And the, if you were to eat that same quantity of sugar, whereas if you see a low glycemic index spike, gram for gram carbohydrate, that that the amount of time that it takes, or the area under the curve is much, much more spread out. So for example, if you were to eat the equivalent of 50 grams of carbohydrate from asparagus, you've got way lower glycemic index than you would from eating a slice of white bread or a bagel. Now the challenge is that this glycemic index works well on singular foods, but the moment that, let's say we have some whole wheat toast with a cucumber to make a sandwich, <laughs> it's a delicious cucumber sandwich. Maybe we put some some uh, chickpeas on it for hummus. What like what? What's our glycemic now? Or our, our glycemic, glycemic index, index now? What, what happens, happens if we have some? Do we have cornflakes? Oh, we've got bran cereal at forty-two, and we've got skim milk at thirty-two. But let's say we put a slice of banana on it. What's our glycemic index now? The challenge with glycemic index is it's ex extremely individualized for different people. Your glycemic index is also going to be related to your insulin status. And so uh, some people have insulin resistance and their ability to clear sugar is going to impede the ability to use glycemic index. And so glycemic index, interestingly, can't be used, can't 
you cannot use it as a marketing tool for food products in Canada. It has been used in other jurisdictions, but it can't be used in Canada because of this nuance that everyone is different. And the fact that you've got these numerical values means that it's challenging to use from an advertising and marketing perspective. So you may be incorporating this, let's say you're a private chef or a celebrity, you may be incorporating this knowing full well with good knowledge that it's important. But let's say you're now a chef at a restaurant like uh, Care Foods, Kelsey's, let, let, let's say, for, for example, um, you can't put this on a menu. You can't. And if you're making a consumer packaged food, you cannot use it as part of your marketing. Oh, here's another one. Omega fatty acids. This is a really good one. So better fats mean better health outcomes. And omega fatty acids, in particular omega-3, only omega-3 has a really strong net benefit. We have lots and lots of omega-6 and 9 in our diet. You will see consumer packaged products out there saying, we've got omega-6 fatty acids in there, we've got omega-9 fatty acids in there, but it's really omega-3s that are important. And why? Because omega-3, when it's taken by our body and converted into um, other things, omega-3 becomes what's called an anti-inflammatory prostaglandin. And that just means that it helps reduce inflammation within the body. So that's a great thing. We don't like inflammation. Whereas omega-6 and 9 are pro-inflammatory and increase those pro-inflammatory prostaglandins. So we want to shift towards more omega-3. Where do we get omega-3? From cold water fish and to a lesser extent from plants and nuts and seeds, flaxseed, walnuts, um, hemp seeds. These are good sources of good omega fatty acids. Challenge with omega-3 fatty acids is they tend to oxidize. And I've got some other videos if you want to learn about fat oxidation, uh, you can check out my YouTube channel. Um, there are other better fats that are out there. The, the um, Conjugated linolenic acid is another one, and this is found in um, grass-fed dairy. There is some evidence showing that um, conjugated linolenic acid is linked to better weight management. Um, about 10 years ago, there was a big shift to get rid of trans fat in food products. And nowadays, you won't see a lot of trans fat in food products because the food manufacturing sector has done a really great job of eliminating it from, from foods. But there used to be a lot of partially hydrogenated fats in foods. And now we're using what's called interesterification to create hard stock fats instead of using hydrogenation. So... Trans fat is bad. We have lots of scientific evidence showing that trans fat increases rates of cardiovascular disease. Another one that we see is uh, eliminating saturated fat. And saturated fat has some impact on cardiovascular disease. It's not as bad as trans fat. But there is still benefit from reducing saturated fat. There's a lot of interest in short and medium chain um, fatty acids or Oftentimes you'll see it on food products as MCT, medium chain, medium chain triglycerides. And these are, are, there is evidence that they are somewhat metabolized differently. Instead of, the, instead of them being uh, immediately um, traveling to the liver to become part of your fat storage or your adipose tissue, the, 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 the jiggly parts on your body, if I can use that term, it goes to your blood and as such it is uh, more likely to be converted to energy than stored in your fat deposits in your body. And so we do see a lot of different product innovation in the space. Magic Bullet Coffee is a fun one, and the coconut oil and everything, because it has a lot of uh, naturally occurring medium chain fatty acids. Ooh, here's another one. Uh, this was, We're starting to get away from some of the hardcore science and starting to merge into more of the, wait a second, into head scratchers. But... Antioxidants, yeah, they are really important. And this is one of the reasons that most public health um, authorities are saying eat lots of fruits and vegetables because they are really rich in fruits and vegetables. Antioxidants are phytonutrients. They're not vitamins. So you can, you can get along without them, but they, have, they do have benefits in terms of reducing oxidation of your blood lipids and reducing inflammation. Um, they do come from a wide variety of different molecular families. So it, it could be polyphenols, tannins, melanoidins, flavonols, all sorts of different things. And how scientists evaluated antioxidant was they did um, all sorts of different test tube type experiments. One of them was called ORAC, the Oxygen Radical Absorbance Capacity Assay, or the, the ferric reductase absorbent uh, 
absorbance and protection value, fat values. These are their test tube type experiments. And so it doesn't say anything about whether those nutrients are absorbed into your body or not. And if they are absorbed into your body, where are they deposited? Are they in your blood? Are they in your liver? Are they in your fat stores? And what's really, really surprising is that there are some foods, um, there used to be, used to be, being uh, with the big asterisks, used to be a database of ORAC values of foods, and Oreos were one of the highest scoring foods in that list. And that said, we're not out there encouraging people to eat Oreos because of their antioxidant value. That data list was eliminated by the United States Department of Agriculture back in 2012 because they couldn't link the ORAC or the fat values to actual biological experiments. And so just because a food product said it, it showed a really good antioxidant value in a test tube didn't mean that it uh, linked back to the health benefit that people were being able to um, being able to say. And so antioxidants can't be used on most food products. There are a few exceptions to the rule. Um, green tea is one of them. And so in general, you can't be out there saying this food is high in antioxidants. We know eating fruits and vegetables is important because of the antioxidants, but you can't use it for advertising and marketing purposes. Ooh, low fat. We just talked about that um, for a long time. Reducing fat out of everything was really big. And in, I always say to my students in the innovation class to learn about food history because it's so, it's so interesting to see how trends have emerged over time. Back in the 1970s, there was a lot of research um, at major universities showing dietary fats role in cardiovascular disease. And the food manufacturing and the food service industry swung in and said, you know what, we're just going to eliminate fat from everything. But fat has an important role to play in our diet. It makes you feel full. It delivers satiety, using science terms here. Um, it makes you feel full, and when you eat that fatty, rich food, you don't feel hungry again an hour later. And so the problem from a product development perspective, when, when companies were eliminating fat from everything, then you would use carbohydrates to substitute. And carbohydrates do not make you feel full. Fat has the biggest payload in terms of making you feel full. Protein, the second biggest payload. And carbohydrates have very little payload to making people feel full. And so when you don't feel full, you eat more. So low fat became its biggest worst enemy. And so low fat salad dressings and low fat products are sort of a, they're sort of a fallback to 1980s thinking. They're still out there because Who's still buying food? Baby boomers. <laughs> These were people who were very influential buyers back in the 1980s, and you get stuck in a habit, and you still want that product, and so you will still see low-fat products being formulated. Ooh, this one is a really good science-driven trend. Whole grains and high fiber. We already talked about probiotics, or not probiotics, prebiotics, feeding, feeding your gut. High fiber is another great payload to making you feel full. And it also reduces glycemic index. So when you've got lots of fiber in there, it has all sorts of wonderful net benefits. Um, and so we're looking at um, increasing uh, the amount of whole grains in different food products, um, increasing fruits and vegetables consumption as well. Fiber reduces glycemic index. It reduces the cycling of cholesterol in the gut. So when you're, when you're eating high fiber diets, it um, helps you, um, pardon my language, but it helps you poop out the bile, which is part of the recycling of cholesterol in your body. You excrete bile from your bile duct, and it helps emulsify all the fat that you've eaten. And when you've got fiber, it helps sweep all of that bile out in your poop. <laughs> There's lots of good supporting evidence to, to promote whole, whole grains and high fiber diets. Ooh, gluten-free. This one's, a, this one's a, got some good science behind it, and it's got a lot of trendiness behind it. So celiac disease and gluten allergy are real issues where people are allergic to gluten and have immune responses. But then there was a book written called Wheat Belly, and that that um, that book pushed the idea that eating gluten foods was increasing obesity. And people would get on a gluten-free diet. Well, they'd eliminate a lot of the carbohydrates from their diet, and they found that they would lose weight. Well, I think a lot of the evidence that has been shown why gluten-free diets worked was that people were actually 
intentional about what they were eating. Not so much that gluten had any impact, but instead they were really cautious and careful and paying attention to their weight and paying attention to the quality of the food that they were eating. There has been some discussion whether gluten based foods also have a lot of FODMAPs and that causes distress from a from a digestive perspective. So gluten free um, there's a great Jimmy Kimmel video, and look that one up on YouTube about people eating gluten-free diets. But honestly, there are reasons why people need to be gluten-free that are absolutely legitimate, and there are reasons that people say they need to be gluten-free that are not. And it's frustrating for food service operators, it's frustrating for food manufacturing companies to define which is which. Um, but rest assured, it's still a driving trend within a lot of different products. Ooh, paleo. This one is uh, weird. We're starting to get into some more weird pseudoscience here. But this is the idea that if you were eating a diet as if you were a paleolithic hominid, so one of these ancient people from, from like millions of years ago, um, the thought was that they would be only eating plant and animal foods that were available in ancient times. But when I look at this pile of foods here, a lot of these foods didn't exist in ancient times in this format. Um, but they're saying no grains, no dairy, no legumes, no processed foods, no alcohol, no coffee. Um, and the idea was, well, people living in ancient history had, uh, had no diseases of modern excess. But there's lots of archaeological evidence showing cancers and metabolic diseases in people uh, from ancient civilizations. And um, so it's it's nice to think about and when we look at the variety of different foods that are eaten in the paleo diet well there's a lot of whole uh there's a lot of whole fruits and vegetables there's a lot of fish and it sounds a little bit like a rash diet and so in some respects it's not a bad thing but it's somewhat uh disingenuous to say that paleolithic people didn't have disease because they did and their lifespan was quite short <laughs> I like to drink coffee too, so I don't think I could ever jump on that bandwagon. Oh, here's a, here's a fun one. Uh, keto diets, They this is really, really popular. If you went back in history, though, it may have been called Atkins. And these are two diets where you're eliminating dietary carbohydrates and pushing your body into ketosis. And ketosis is just the physiologic state where your body is burning fat and you're producing ketone bodies. And it shifts your metabolism especially if you've got um, things like pre-diabetes, it can really shift your metabolism in terms of insulin status. So it's a it's extremely low carb diet, trying to get to zero carbs. And it was originally developed in the 1950s. It was revisited in the 1970s, revisited again in the 2000s, and again in the 2010s. And it was originally branded as Atkins and it was renamed as Keto. Um, but it has the ability to push your uh, cardiovascular biomarkers into um, positive range in the short term, but it's difficult to maintain in the long term. There's not a lot of dietary fiber in it. Many people would just go and have a steak for lunch and a steak for dinner and a piece of cheese uh, on the side, and not a lot of dietary fiber. And there's uh, a lot of anecdotal evidence about uh, ketosis rage. The idea that when you were pushing your body into ketosis is normally a starvation state. And so when your body is burning fat as its primary energy source, that's usually occurring only when you're in starvation. And uh, your body gets um, other hormonal responses that put your body into a panic state that you need to be really, really acutely aware. And you think about the evolutionary background to this, your, your body's in a fight or flight mode trying to find food. And a lot of people said that they would experience Atkins rage or ketosis rage in this type of form and so it's hard to maintain over the long term but that said there's a lot of product whether at food service or consumer packaged goods that has a keto type branding again it can't be it can't be labeled and advertised as such but you can on your nutrition facts table have zero carbohydrate and that's an automatic signal to um to individuals that it's compliant with the keto diet. Oh, modified keto or South Beach. This is an oldie. It was um, an Atkins diet that was modified in 2003, and it was a branded trademarked diet using a lot more high fiber and low glycemic index foods and a lot of lean protein and a lot easier to comply with 
than the traditional keto diet. And it would start with a really high protein phase and then ramp back with more carbohydrate foods as people uh, adjusted into the diet. Um, as you can guess, it was driven by California-based uh, food culture, and this one's a little bit easier to manage. Um, but again, something worth looking up. Ooh, raw food. This one, again, a bit more uh, pseudoscience behind this, but the idea is that you're eating no food that's been heated, and oftentimes raw food's combined with vegan. And the idea, uh, using a little bit of pseudoscience here, is that there's vital energy in the food, and the moment that you cook it, you kill it. And so as such, there's lots and lots of different sprouted foods that are supposedly high in this vital energy. So uh, broccoli sprouts, alfalfa sprouts, and wheat sprouts, and lots and lots of juicing that's going on. Um, a big challenge when, you're, when we're saying that we need to eat all those enzymes, most of the enzymes that we're consuming are broken down in our acidic uh, stomach conditions, and then even further broken down in the, in the proteolytic environment in your intestines. You've got all sorts of enzymes in your intestines that are breaking down food. And so for most people who are um, functioning well, the enzymes in your body are doing just fine breaking down the food. Um, cooking is really important, and if you just took your food handlers, you know that in many cases cooking is the best way of eliminating pathogenic bacteria. And in other cases, there are um, chemical compounds in foods uh, that are naturally occurring, completely normal to have in there, but in certain things like, uh, like chickpeas, there are what are known as cyanogenic glycosides in raw chickpeas. There are uh, hemagglutinins and lectins in a lot of different beans and seeds. And eating them raw means that you are getting exposure to all of these anti-nutritional factors that over time can be detrimental in terms of health. Ooh, this was another good pseudoscience one, detox diets. And the idea is that if you're eating all sorts of gunk and junk and processed foods, that you get all this accumulation of gunk in your body and you need to rinse that gunk out from your intestines and liver. And so the, oftentimes you find these in different uh, fashion and... Um, oh, I, I want to say Gwyneth Paltrow's magazines. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to pick a, a defamation suit against me, but uh, these detox diets do not have a lot of legitimacy. In essence, you you have a kidney, you have liver, you have two kidneys, actually, you have a liver, you have intestines, and these are your body's means of deciding what is important for your body to retain and what your body needs to excrete. And we have really great way of detoxing ourselves with our normal physiologic function. That said, juice is absolutely hot right now and all sorts of different companies are producing juice type products and juice type diets. And I think there's a lightness of being when uh, you go into a low calorie status and just consume a really light diet for a period of time, but it isn't from some sort of physiologic detox that's occurring. It is from the low calorie and semi-fasted state. Ooh, superfoods. Um, this was bigger back in the early 2000s, but the idea was that there were these foods that have wonderful, um, extraordinary health benefits, and you would label them uh, almost as if they were superheroes and belonged in the comic books. So it included a wide variety of things, pomegranates, kale, flax seeds, blueberries, acai berries, goji berries, and so on. Um, a lot of these were really high in antioxidants. And as we already discussed on an earlier slide, you can't use antioxidants as a marketing tool. And uh, a number of uh, global governments have repealed their antioxidant um, labeling status and the United States Department of Agriculture repealed its uh, antioxidant database. It cannot be used as a marketing tool. And again, the regulatory capability of evaluating what's out there is extremely difficult. That's why in Canada we have some of the uh, most strict capabilities of what you can say about food products. You, a, a, you really can't go out there and call things superfoods. Ooh! Here's a fun one. High fructose corn syrup. A lot of companies reach out to me and say, ah, oh, we want to re eliminate the use of high fructose corn syrup in our food products. What is high fructose corn syrup? Well, in essence, we're taking uh, cornstarch 
from field corn, and we're converting it using, uh, first, um, we're using glucoamylase to produce glucose. So starch is just a big polymer of glucose, and glucose, as you know, is sugar. And then we're using uh, what's called glucose, uh, oh, what is it? Glucose isomerase. Oh, I had a brain fart for a moment there. Glucose isomerase converts glucose to fructose, and fructose just happens to be sweeter gram for gram than glucose, but it has the same number of calories. So let's say you don't need as many grams of fructose to get the same amount of sweetness. That's a net benefit in terms of the calorie count. So you get less sugar, so you need less ingredients overall, and you get the same sweetness impact. Lower calories, then less ingredient cost. And so the challenge is fructose is more readily metabolized to fat precursors. It's metabolized first to glycerol 3 phosphate, and as such, it's more likely to accumulate as fat deposits in your body. Um, what's ironic, as companies say, well, I don't want high fructose corn syrup, but they'll all say, well, I want to use honey instead. Well, honey just happens to be naturally high in fructose. Or they'll say, oh, let's use agave syrup. Well, that's a really high natural source of fructose. And the challenge is, if you're really trying to eliminate that nutritional source of fructose, are you actually reducing fructose? Or are you just substituting a word that has greater appeal to a consumer? And that consumer may not understand exactly what they're seeing. Ooh, no refined sugar. This is another one where people are trying to reduce and eliminate sugars within food products. For those of you who are working on consumer packaged goods, sugars now have to be grouped and labeled as such. And so you, you can't just hide sugar like you used to be able to 10 years ago where you'd say, we have dehydrated cane syrup. Well, that has to be grouped as added sugars within the ingredient declaration. But a wide variety of more natural sugars, things like rice malt or jaggery, palm sugar, uh, coconut sugar, date syrup, grape, um, grape syrup, would be used as a natural sweetener instead. Um, in other cases, uh, companies are looking at reducing sugar by using uh, non-nutritive sweeteners, things like aspartame or stevia, sucralose. These are all non-nutritive sweeteners. But sugar is still sugar, and um, a lot of times people will say, well, I want to put maple syrup in my formula because it's more nutritious. Well, it really doesn't contribute a lot from a nutrition perspective, and I... Um, encourage you to try comparing what would happen if you put it into the ESHA database and compare. This is the fun of using ESHA. You can compare side by side the nutrition contribution by swapping off ingredients without actually having to do a lot of testing. Many of the non-nutritive or artificial sweeteners have a lot of stigma because they are chemicals. And while everything that we eat is a chemical, natural, synthetic, it doesn't matter, everything is a chemical, a lot of consumers are uh, afraid of chemical sounding names on an ingredient declaration and they are avoiding artificial sweeteners despite the fact that they have been proven to be safe and have decades of safe use. Oh, how about more decades of safe use? No additives, preservatives, hormones, or antibiotics. There's a lot of push right now for reduction of additives in food products and in many respects that's a really good thing. It's um, It means that there's a lot of research opportunity for food scientists. It means that there needs to be a lot of creative approaches from processors and product developers to uh, get shelf life and food safety. Um, that said, going out there and saying that meat is free of hormones, there's lots of naturally occurring hormones in meat. Any living creature has hormones of some form and it's there have been a number of different major cases where companies have said we are free from hormones. Well, no, you are free from added hormones. And so you have to be really careful about how you're stating different marketing claims. Um, in some respects, there's a lot of really good science. Um, so, for example, reducing antibiotic use in uh, animal agriculture is a really important trend right now. And there's a lot of science saying that the overuse of antibiotics in animal agriculture is a negative. Um but additives and preservatives have a really important function to play in terms of reducing food waste and extending shelf life on food products. And so they have to be used judiciously. You can't just go in there and paint uh, all the food products as, as negative because they contain additives and preservatives. You need to be really careful because we're reducing food waste and we're extending shelf life on a wide variety of different food products because of our use of it. So we're really judicious about that. Well, no nitrates. This is a unique niche within the no additives. Um, 
this is interesting because nitrates have been linked with um, intestinal cancers. And so consuming high levels of processed meat has shown correlation to intestinal cancer. Um, that said, nitrates are naturally occurring in a lot of uh, vegetables in particular. Leafy greens have high level of natural nitrates, and the, the meat manufacturing sector has actually taken advantage of this using celery as one of the highest natural nitrate sources. And you, will com you can find celery extract as a means of um, adding naturally occurring nitrates into uh, processed meats. And so it's ironic when people say, I don't want to eat nitrates, but then they're eating a salad because that is naturally occurring nitrate in high concentration. The challenge with, with a lot of these different studies is that correlation is not causation. And um, what we also see is that populations that are typically eating high amounts of processed meat, and when I say high amounts of processed meat, we're talking about um, populations where processed meat is a major part of the dietary intake of protein on a daily basis. Um, these tend to be low-income uh, populations. So we're not talking about eating high-end charcuterie. We're talking about eating hot dogs because they're cheap. And what's challenging is that we have social determinants of health. So when people are low-income, they tend to have other issues that are compounding health and wellness. They're likely not able to access fruits and vegetables. They're likely unable to access pre preventative health and health screening. They are also likely to be um, less able to exercise or able to um, take care of themselves in a wide variety of other ways. And so it's really, really challenging. And the literature has indicated that a high um, consumption of processed meat is also linked to low income status. And that's because Processed meat isn't just charcuterie. It could be hot dogs, it could be bologna, it could be bacon, it could be some of the lowest cost meat products that are available to us. Ooh, organic. This one's, this one's a great trend in that there is a lot of really strong benefits to this. It's not from a nutrition perspective. It is actually because of the economics in that the environmental economics and the local uh, business development behind organic agricultural production has a lot of benefits. But in, uh, in general, the nutritional delivery of organic foods may be slightly higher, but there also tends to be a higher presence of fungal toxins and stress response phytochemicals within organic produced products. It's misleading to say that there's no chemicals applied to organic uh, fruits and vegetables or organic um, meats. There are a wide variety of approved pesticides and herbicides and um, health-promoting um, agents for animals that can be used in organic production. So, for example, um, organic lettuce may have Bacillus thuringiensis uh, toxin applied to it, and that is a naturally occurring toxin that's found in uh, bacteria called Bacillus thuringiensis, and when uh, worms or caterpillars eat that Bacillus thuringiensis, those worms die. There's uh, pyrethrins, uh, nic uh, nicotinoid uh, compounds, there's copper sulfate. These are all compounds that are commonly used in organic agriculture as um, pesticides. And as such, it's misleading to say that there's not pest control involved in organic agriculture. There is controversy behind organic agriculture. If we are going to feed the um, 8 billion people that are on this earth, we need to be really cognizant of how we're using the land. And organic agriculture can be land intensive. That You need more land space to produce the same amount of food. And so we do need to be balancing and really creative in how we're doing organic agriculture to make sure that we're not um, taking forests and more land out of use. We need to be protecting the environment through organic agriculture. Oh, how about GMO-free? So genetically modified organisms have been uh, developed as a means of agricultural production advantage. And so um, using genetic modification, plants can be created so that they're resistant to disease. They're more able to uh, be grown without the need for pesticides or herbicides. Um, and now we're seeing uh, future generation genetically modified organisms that have nutritional and processing benefits. So you can genetically modify uh, different crops to increase the nutritional quality. Um, 
Historically, a lot of the work that was done was through what was called transgenics, where you take genes from different organisms and transplant them into another uh, food plant or animal. But what we're now seeing is we're using CRISPR and using uh, direct gene slices so that we're not introducing foreign genes. We're just directly manipulating um, the genetics within there. So what's called cisgenic transformation. And um, a lot of the history behind this, uh, genetically modified organisms were initially introduced in the 1980s with a big swing in the 1990s. Um, initially, there's a lot of pushback saying, oh, well, we're consuming foreign DNA. We don't want it. Well, we consume DNA all the time. And there's no harm from consuming DNA. We, we do it every time you're eating fruits and vegetables, you're consuming foreign DNA. Um, it's, it's, it, it's misleading. What, what is concerning about genetic modification is the consolidation of control by corporations of the food supply, where a few companies have developed the genetic traits, and then they go and they trademark those traits and uh, reduce the ability of food producers to be able to go out and produce food in, in um, independent ways. So genetic modification is, it's worth watching, but not necessarily from a nutrition and diet perspective, more so from a political perspective to see how corporations are controlling our food supply. Ooh, humane. This one's a big, big push uh, recently where we're, we're, we're seeing that animal agriculture is important for providing protein to the diet. But making sure that those animals are cared for appropriately. There's been a wide variety of different exposés within the animal agriculture sector showing animals being abused and being treated very poorly. Um, and so we are seeing a lot more push towards free range or humanely treated or humanely slaughtered food products. I haven't talked about kosher or halal or some of the different um, religious tenets that are um, connected with food trends. I don't consider them trends, I consider them uh, realities. And um, these are religious practices that um, have had aspects of humane animal slaughter attributed to them. Or, and in some cases, it's, it's been controversial within different, within different countries saying, well, is, is kosher slaughter or halal slaughter actually a humane practice? When done right, I think it is. Um, we have a lot of animal agriculture that requires the slaughter of animals. Um, I think it is important to be really cognizant about the welfare of animals. And I think humane um, animal welfare is going to be really important moving into the future, making sure that animals are treated fairly in the process. There has been pushback saying, well, if we're going to treat the animals fairly, why are we not focused on the people? And so this, I think, is going to be another emergent trend, focusing on fair trade and sustainable labor. This past pandemic and the past few months, we've seen just how urgent the food supply is, and we've seen how the people who are in manufacturing and in growing of our food have a really, really critical role to play. And when we are not taking care of them properly, our entire food supply chain suffers. And so I think this aspect of fair trade and sustainable labor practices is going to be absolutely critical in, uh, in the future. And it's going to show up more and more that um, the food companies will be able to go out there and say, we, we can prove that we have had fair wages, we have had fair pay, we have had um, availability of union uh, organizing within, within our food organizations or agri-food agri supply chain, that we've been providing appropriate immigration pathways for food workers. We've provided health and welfare for the people who are producing our food products. This, I think, is going to be a key message for food companies into the future. Oh, I put this up here because as I'm coming to a close, this has been a little bit longer than my typical videos, but I think it's been a, a great video and I hope you've enjoyed it, uh, having this conversation with me. There have been just, nutrition is such a really interesting field to study and nutrition history is fascinating. I put this up, but it's, a, it's an ad from 1940 and it says, stay fit and slim by taking amphetamine. And as you know, amphetamine are um, illegal drugs at this point. But once upon a time, um, a wide variety of different pharmaceutical agents were promoted for 
staying slim. There are diets out there saying eat tapeworms and you will lose weight. Smoke cigarettes and you will lose weight. Well, <laughs> we can't go out and promote these things anymore. But this is this is the the the, the the absolute fascination behind nutrition science is that a lot of it is completely influenced by trends. There are books out there that are saying eat for your blood type. So let's say I've got uh, a negative blood. Well, I should be eating these certain foods, whereas my my spouse has the positive blood and he should be eating different foods. Well, um, there are books out there and people who swear up and down there are diets out there like the cabbage soup diet or the lemon juice diet or all sorts of weird things that have no scientific merit whatsoever yeah if you did take amphetamines yes you would lose weight because you'd be so distracted by the high that you're on that you wouldn't be worried about eating um but do be aware of these wacky things and and in some cases they have been um they have been panned by the scientific community, but they have been sort of a flash in the pan in terms of uh, people making money. You want to be absolutely aware of these trends and not not afraid of them, but at the same time, do be aware that the science-driven trends are the ones that stick around and they have longevity behind them. I hope you had some fun with this. Did we miss any trends? Absolutely. I'm sure we missed a lot of different food trends in this list. The trend landscape is constantly changing. And so again, we have to think about where are those different influencers, looking at different menus, looking at different media outlets, looking at different influencer cultures. Um, I'm, I'm not a TikTok user, but I bet there's all sorts of wacky stuff going on in different social media platforms that are influencing um, young adults in particular, where that, that trend setting most often occurs. So just... My take-home message is here. We do want to balance public opinion and consumer demand with good science and nutrition recommendations from government and dietetic organizations. As I mentioned before, registered dietitians are really the only designated profession in Canada that can make dietary recommendations. There are a lot of allied fields, such as culinary and uh, food manufacturing, that rely on this nutrition information to be able to um, format high-quality products. But that said... A lot of this trend and influencer culture is important from a money-making perspective, and we need to respect that balancing act between the two to say, yeah, we are respecting good nutrition science, as well as being able to have sustainable and profitable businesses. And so my last point is that we're the biggest trend that I'm seeing moving forward in terms of in terms of food formulation comes back to those aspects of transparency, fairness, and sustainability. And um, I have some other videos coming up about the Canadian Food Guide and its transition over the years and how it's changed away from uh, so much focus on nutrition to focus on sustainability and transparency and fairness. So do be really aware about that. It's not so much nutrition as it is just a trend, but I think our understanding of the wellness and the well-being that comes from eating also comes from our um, psychological well-being, knowing that the food that we're eating is good for us and good for our communities. So I think that's it. Oh, it is it. So I always leave uh, folks on my videos with a, with a message saying, I love it when you reach out and ask questions. I, I know that when we're normally together at Niagara College, so many folks from culinary land drop by my office and just ask questions, and I see so much value in that. Do ask questions as you're going along. The faculty at Niagara College is really committed to seeing everyone succeed as a community. And so just because you're in one program doesn't mean you shouldn't ask questions of another professor and learn something new. So do reach out and ask questions. And I always love to hear from you. And we'll talk again soon. Take care.